Welcome to all of you to, uh, to this event on media information and the U.S.-Russia relationship. I'm John Chorciari. I direct our Wiser Diplomacy Center here at the Ford School. And I'm delighted to co-host uh, this special event with our friends from the UM Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Um, seldom, if ever, since the Cold War has the U.S. relationship with Russia had more obvious importance, whether we're looking at Ukraine and the impeachment process, nuclear politics, authoritarian currents in Eastern Europe, or events in Syria and Iran, the relationship has profound regional and global ramifications. In many ways, the relationship is, of course, rocky and even adversarial marked by conflicting interests and ideological tension. Uh, media information and disinformation play crucial roles in how the U.S. and Russia engage one another and how public audiences view both of them. This isn't an easy time for journalists or for diplomats working on the U.S.-Russia relations, but both have crucial roles to play within and between the two countries. And that's why we've assembled this special panel with our experts today uh, here at the Ford School. Um, we'll start uh, by introducing Ambassador Susan Elliott, who is on your right, my left, um, President and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. She served in a number of senior diplomatic roles, including most recently as civilian deputy and foreign policy advisor to the commander of the U.S. European Command. Prior to that, she served as U.S. Ambassador to Tajikistan. She's also been a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asian Affairs uh, and has served in Russia, in Northern Ireland, Peru, Peru Greece, uh, and in roles at Maine State, uh, including Deputy Executive Secretary. And so she brings a wealth of practical experience and expertise on U.S.-Russia relations and the surrounding region. In the center, Dr. Yevgenia Albats is a Russian investigative journalist, political scientist, and author, and a radio host. Uh, she is a 2019-20 Distinguished Fellow at UM's International Institute and Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. Since 2007, she's been a uh, political editor and then editor-in-chief and CEO of The New Times, a Moscow-based Russian language independent political weekly. Uh, it went digital in June 2017 when its distribution and sales were severed by the Russian authorities. Uh, since 2004, she's hosted Absolute Albats, a talk show on Echo Moscovy, uh, which is the only remaining radio station of its type in Russia presenting a liberal view. Uh, she's been an Alfred Friendly Press Fellow assigned to the Chicago Tribune, a Neiman Fellow at Harvard, uh, and a Fellow at Kelly's Writers House and Perry House at the University of Pennsylvania. She graduated from Moscow State University uh, and got a PhD in political science from Harvard. Uh, she's taught at Yale and at Moscow's Higher School of Economics until 2011 when her courses were canceled at the request of top Kremlin officials. She's a member of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, and she's also the author of four books related to the history of the KGB. Closest to me is our own Ambassador Mel Levitsky, a professor of international policy and practice at the Ford School and a retired career minister in the U.S. Foreign Service. Ambassador Levitsky is also a senior advisor to the Wiser Diplomacy Center and to the Center of Russia, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Uh, he's been ambassador to Bulgaria and Brazil, assistant secretary of state for international narcotics matters, uh, and executive secretary also at the State Department, deputy director of the Voice of America. He also has a bunch of Russia-related experience. He directed the State Department's Office of UN Political Affairs and served as officer in charge of U.S.-Soviet bilateral relations and also served as a political officer in Moscow. So you've got a tremendous amount of expertise on the topic at hand. Just a word on format before I hand it over to Mel to moderate a conversation. After he uh, uh, converses with our special guests. Um, you'll have people going around with note cards so that you can write down questions. They'll then be passed uh, here to the front uh, where uh, two of our st uh, st uh, Ford School students, uh, Gordon and Nathan, uh, will ask a, a representative sample uh, of your questions to the panel. And then after the session uh, at 530, uh, we'll move outside for a reception, uh, including uh, an introduction of a gift of paintings uh, t uh, donated to the Ford School by Bill Manthorpe, uh, painted by uh, his late wife, Judy Manthorpe. So please join me in welcoming our special guests, including Bill Manthorpe, here to the Ford School. Okay. Um, first off, uh, rather than say, Madam Ambassador, Dr. 
Ambassador, let's use Susan, Yevgenia, and Mel. Okay, How's that? Fine. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Mel means various things in various languages. In Russian, it means chalk, I guess, Mel. Mel? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> I, pref I preferred it when I was ambassador to Brazil because Mel means honey in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so whether I'm chalk or, or, or honey, you, you could make the determination. Um, well, thank you both for, for doing this. This is a really terrific time uh, to have this conversation, especially because yesterday and this morning we have some new news from Russia about what looks like a planned governmental shake up. Uh, I suspect that uh, the end result will be to give Mr. Putin a little bit more power beyond 2024, but I'd like to hear your, uh, beyond 2024 when he can't run for, uh, for president again, uh, but I'd like to hear your opinions on that as well as we talk about the media. So my experience basically was during the Cold War. Uh, the Russian media at the time was completely controlled in a way that very few people would read Pravda or Izviestia. Um, people look for other sources than the nightly news program Vremya. Um, people listen to shortwave radio. At one point I was a de deputy director of the Voice of America, and which was supposed to broadcast as the BBC objective news, but also uh, gave a sense of what US policy was. Uh, it was Cold War and we used a number of devices rather than use hot war to try to influence the opinions of both countries uh, because the, Rus the Soviets also had their own broadcasting mechanism when we had the various magazines that we exchanged. Um, so but during my time there was always this theory of convergence. I know you remember this. There was some a theory back when I was a, a student here at the University of Michigan, for example, that's a long time ago, by the way, um, that in fact the two systems would converge. They, we would become more like the so-called so socialist system. They would become more free and open and more democratic. And there were a number of scholars who actually thought that there would be a convergence. That didn't happen uh, during, the, uh, during the Cold War. It was a, um, an organizing principle for US policy um, I remember uh, Georgi Arbatov, who was head, was a Central Committee member at the time when I was in Moscow. His son is now uh, prominent, I guess, in, the, in, uh, in Russia. But I remember he said when the Soviet Union was breaking up, we're going to play a great trick on you. We're going to take away your enemy. So if you think about that, during that Cold War period, over 40 years, U.S. policy was centered on that conflict. And when it was gone, we did search for purpose for a while. Now it, it's kind of back, not in the same ways, but in certain ways. And so this is, we want to talk about this, but what I'm really interested in hearing from you two, you have more uh, knowledge, particularly current knowledge on this is, so how do, people in, how do people in Russia get their information? What do they base their, their, their opinions on? What's the role of social media? I mean, it's very strong in the United States, of course, as well. Uh, are they reading newspapers? I know the, Russia, Rus the Russian uh, population when I was there was a terrific uh, readers of books. You, everybody carried a book on the subway, on the metro. They, everybody was reading something or another. Once in a while, they'd get a, a book from, for example, Kurt Vonnegut, who would, was published uh, mm -hmm. you know, by a publisher in, uh, in, uh, in Moscow. So what I, if we take about oh five to ten minutes, however you, much you would like, to kind of discuss. Where, so where do we stand with the, the media? You have, of course, direct experience. You were there uh, recently as well. Let's let's try to get a sense of what what are the control. Are there some pockets of free expression? You know, we all read about Navalny, who is leading a what would have been called a dissident movement. I'm not quite sure what you would call it now, but certainly a popular movement that at least um, has some, uh, some expression that can get out of the country uh, a little bit easier than it was then. So I want to look at that. So what, what's the role of social media? What's the role of the regular media? How do Russians get news? And um, give you one more example. I have a student who came to me last year, undergraduate student, I don't know if she's here, um, 
And she was going to work for a, a US consulting firm in Moscow as an intern. And her parents were a little concerned. It wasn't a, a regular kind of uh, internship with, you know, with, uh, under the auspices of the embassy or something like that. And we talked over a period of time. She decided to go. And so she came back. And the other day, two days ago, she came in. We talked. And so I learned a lot about what the young people, because she hung out with a bunch of young people, both uh, Russians and other, some foreign students and others. And it turns out that social media does, in fact, have quite, a, quite an influence. How much? in terms of the more adult, older population is another question. So these are things that we want to cover. Let me then, uh, oh, and may I say one word about the pictures. So Bill Manthorpe, when we were in Moscow, and I was a second secretary, and I was in charge of looking at things like Jewish immigration. This was during the period of detente in the, in the Nixon administration. Um, and uh, so I was out in the street a lot. You know, you've heard about you know, what is the street saying? What are people saying? Met with a lot of artists and uh, writers, uh, many of whom didn't write officially, but wrote for the so-called, the, the, the under the table for the drawer. Um, and Bill and Judy Manthorpe were uh, in this diplomatic complex. We were on seventh floor, Joan? Ninth floor? Eighth floor. They were a few floors down below. There was a ele funny elevator that went up and down. All the rooms were bugged, of course, so we, you know, we knew they were bugged. It didn't really affect the conversation too much because we weren't going dis to discuss classified information. Uh, but Judy uh, was, a wonderful, and was a wonderful painter, and she painted all kinds of styles. So Judy, unfortunately, passed away three years ago. Uh, Bill uh, lives in, uh, in Delaware, near the coast. And um, we talked over a period of time about bringing Judy's pictures here of Moscow. She painted several pictures of Moscow um, to here as we re receive this award of a grant from the U.S. Russia Foundation. Perfect. Uh, and so you'll see those outside. And I want to thank Bill for. I mean, we worked on this over a number over a number of months, and this is a really for us. A, I like Judy a lot. My, uh, my wife was very good friends with her as well, and it's a really terrific tribute to her. So now let's get to it. May I ask you, Evgeny, if you would um, give us some thoughts on since you were in media, had various experiences, good I suppose in some cases, not so good in other cases. What what's the role, and is there a future for the media gaining more? presence in, in uh, Russia life. And then I want to talk about this, this uh, new kerfuffle, as they say. So please. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me for this event. I'm really honored to speak here. I'm going to give a special lecture on Russian media 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall at the end of this month. Uh, at Weiser Center, so I will talk, uh, you know, specifics I will leave for uh, this lecture. Um, and when you, you know, when we spoke about this, you know, over the phone, I said that Russian media are dead. It's, you can say that dead man is walking, you know, <laughs> but basically there is uh, um, one internet based TV channel left, TV Rain, one uh, broadcasting left, that's Echo Moskvi, which is uh, still, you know, that's the, uh, the broadcasting which is owned by the state affiliated company and there is no media which are, uh, except for some internet based media which are owned not by state or state uh, affiliated companies. There is uh, three, I would say, independent uh, media websites. The New Times, the Bell, which is basically <coughs> run out of uh, Berkeley, and Medusa, which is run out of uh, Riga, the capital of uh, Latvia, uh, the border state with the border state with Russia. So uh, that's basically it. So it's dead, and however, having said that, we should also acknowledge that there is a new sort of a media appear on YouTube. YouTube becomes the most important medium 
in Russia. For instance, uh, there is a, a famous uh, interior, uh, Yuri Dut. He has over six million subscribers. That's bigger than the audience of the uh, major news uh, program on Channel One. Um, Alexei Navalny has his show. He has about three million subscribers. And several other presenters who used to be TV personalities, they started uh, issuing their shows on YouTube. Now, there is a plan to, mm, there is some research done on the impact of the social uh, networks on the voting behavior. Uh, and we know that it's quite different in the West and in my part of the world. Whereas in the democratic countries, Facebook and others, they're more into promoting the populist uh, politicians and populist views. In my part of the world, in authoritarian countries, <coughs> Facebook, Twitter, and other uh, social networks, they serve as a source of information. And according to the latest poll or research conducted by the independent Levada Center pollster, uh, in the age group 24 uh, to, 30, uh, to 35, people in this uh, age group, they get the majority of their news from the social networks, as opposed to those who are over 50, who predominantly get their news from the propaganda channels, meaning Russian TV. Just so you understand, there is no one network left which is not under control of the Russian state or state affiliated companies like um, Gazprom banks, that's basically intelligence, or like Gazprom or you know some others. Uh, so that's the situation with the Russian media. Um, it is a huge problem for Russian journalists, especially in my age group, I'm 61 year old, uh, who spend uh, lives in the moral, you know, in the Russian uh, uh, media organization, and now left without jobs. There is just, you know, there are a hell of a lot of cases when good journalists move to PR companies, to GR, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's also, it's very bad because, you know, when time comes and it will come, when we will take over, when Russian opposition will run the country, uh, of course it's going to happen, and, you know, I hope you believe in this, as much as I do, that, you know, we will face the same problem we faced back at the end of Perestroika and the, when collapse of the USSR happened in 1991. It was that we didn't have real investigative journalists who knew how to do the job. That's a huge problem. Full stop. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we'll get into this discussion about what's just happened uh, a little bit later. Why don't, you, why don't you pick up on the same theme? Now, one of the things about U.S. government policy is this constant effort to inform, to persuade, to make other, have other countries, other populations try to understand what U.S. policy is. When I was deputy director of the, uh, the Voice of America, we broadcast, we thought, like the BBC by short wave. I don't think anybody has a short wave set anymore. Maybe a few people, but not for a hobby. But, uh, but we were able to get a signal into Moscow, and there were a lot of, um, a lot of Russians uh, that I met that listened to the, both the English language broadcast, which was came through without jamming, and the Russian language broadcast, which was jammed periodically. No, 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 all the time. Well. Okay. All the time, it was jammed all the time. I have to, I, well, you know, I've been listening, I was the listener to BBC and Voice of America, you know? Yeah, but I'll tell you, you, I'll tell you what, you could get it in certain places in the Soviet Union, because when I used to travel, I would take this Zenith radio, which was about this big, with a big aerial on it, 
shortwave, and you could actually listen to it. Now, I'm not sure how many Russian And you got Soviet connected to the satellite that <laughs> the CIA put somewhere no, no, up no, there, no? No, 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 no okay. satellite. Okay. <laughs> it was a signal. You know, signals bounce like this, and they end up somewhere. <laughs> we hope in the right places. <laughs> so um, could you talk a little bit about, from your perspective, having uh, served there a couple of times, and then having been in the area and worked in the State Department, um, views that you have on the role of the media and what can the wh what is it possible for the U.S. government to do to better inform the Russian public if that's possible? Um, that's a broad subject, I know, but please, you're, you're for. Well, I think I can. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. This is really an honor for me to be here, especially with Yevgenia, because uh, the last time I served in Moscow, um, I had a lot of contact with her at New Times, and really, she. Um, I want to call her a guiding light or maybe, you know, a, a pillar because she always really not only was investigative journalist but not afraid to speak the truth and speak her mind and there aren't many people who are willing to do that anymore given the kinds of constraints that we see not just in Russia but around the world. But one thing I can speak to is because I'd like to talk a little bit about the U.S.-Russia relationship. Sure. We can get sure. to that but in terms of media, <clears throat> my last um, um, two assignments. One was in Europe working with the U.S. military, but the other was in Central Asia. And one of the things we tried to do in terms of U.S. Um, government was look for alternatives to um, Russian state television because people, at least in Central Asia, most everybody still speaks Russian and there are no alternatives uh, in Tajik language or Kyrgyz language. Maybe a few, but none that have wide distribution so everyone listens to Russian media. And I can give you a good example when um, <coughs> When the Russians took Crimea in 2014, I happened to be in the U.S. when I came back. I had some Tajik women who worked for me, and so I said, oh, what do you think about what's happening in Crimea? And they said, oh, um, the Russians had to go in because, you know, the fascists have taken over, and it's going to be like World War II again. And so there was this whole message. I said, well, who told you that? And then, well, we heard it, you know, on TV. So for most people in, I think, in Central Asia, especially in poorer areas, television is, um, even for younger people, because in Tajikistan only maybe less than 20% people have access to the internet, at least in their homes. So, um, so through t phones, you know, younger people would have, but it was very difficult to find alternatives, and that's one of the things that we worked on at the time. I left in 2015, but trying to support um, media or uh, stations that perhaps wanted to be an alternative to the Russian, you know, media, um, but just had a lot of difficulty getting airspace, getting airtime, and um, and so that was a difficult uh, thing. And I even saw uh, even the extent of the Russian, you know, media has gone into other languages. So not only do they give their I'll use the word propaganda, but their uh, point of view, but then. They have not I mean, RT, you know, they're in all over Europe, the Russian uh, media is behind a lot of language um, broadcasting in German, in Romanian, not just countries of uh, former Wa Warsaw Pact, but in Western Europe as well. So it's really hard, I think, even in our own country to kind of sort out, um, you know, what is real and what um, isn't real. I mean, even... You know, of course, this is a debate among um, U.S. It? It's yeah. all fake news, yeah. right? Well, but at least we have a choice of looking at the Fox fake or the CNN right. fake no, or the kidding. NBC <laughs> fake <laughs> and determine. So I think that's something that the U.S. really had tried to do, and um, but it's extremely difficult to um, because a lot of it is based on money and advertisement to be able to promote a different voice or a differing point of view, especially when the overwhelming, mm -hmm. um, you know, control is from Russia, and especially in the, you know, the countries of, I would imagine in the Caucasus too, but definitely in sure. countries of, yeah. of Central Asia. And uh, they had also a different narrative on 
what was happening in Afghanistan, and um, you know, sometimes I hear things reported, even even in, like in the local channels, you know, things that maybe I did or the U.S. did, which really weren't, you know, yeah. weren't true. Um, but it's extremely difficult, and uh, uh, I don't have, you know, we had Voice of America and other um, things in the past. I do think, and I do think young people, like most of you in the audience, look for ways to get around these, um, or to find real news. Um, Yevgeny mentioned YouTube. I noticed I was just recently, because my organization does a lot with China, that in um, China, even in uh, Russia, well, even in places like Saudi Arabia, this isn't just unique to Russia, that people have to, you get a VPN line, you guys know more about this than I do, and you can go around, because even when we were just in China and talking about, well, you don't have any access to Google or you know Google-based um, information. Oh yeah, we do, but and then you know here's how we get around it. So there are ways to get around it, and I would say in China, they're probably more repressive in that there's no, you know, it's very mm -hmm. difficult to get real information, and um, and even I witnessed it. I was there when there were um, um, the protests in Hong Kong, and in the hotel they had the BBC and CNN. But in, in the BBC showed it more than CNN, but because I think because it used to be a British protector. But anytime something came on about Hong Kong, the screen went blank. You yeah. know, they jammed it. So I had really never, you know, seen that. And at first I thought, oh, there's something wrong with my TV. I never called the front desk. But no, then it comes back afterwards. So it's very blatant there. It's like, and you would see that they're going to talk about Hong Kong and then they cut it off. Yeah. But it's something that I think that. Um, is something U.S. government would definitely mm -hmm. and does try to be um, involved in. And sometimes I think where we've gotten crossways, and I'm not saying this is right, but with countries of former Soviet Union, Russia in particular, is they think that if we want to give a different message, that the message is to foment, you know, overthrow, mm -hmm. regime mm -hmm. change, color revolution, you know, mm -hmm. you name it, which in my opinion isn't always true. Um, but I think that goes back to, and we can talk more about this, is maybe you mentioned convergence, Mel. Um, I think I served in Moscow after fall of Soviet Union, 1992 to 94, and I just guess I thought, because I was, you know, a naive uh, young American diplomat thinking, well, you know, communism is gone, and most people want democracy and want to be part of the liberal, um, you know, democratic uh, community. And, you know, Russia will find its way that way. Um, and I think there have been mistakes made, you know, on our side and their side along the way. But, um, and I did give credit that there wasn't, um, there was a war in Tajikistan, but, you know, there wasn't a war. It was kind of a peaceful transition um, that happened, given the kinds of things that had to mm -hmm. be sorted out. But I think that's a mistake that we, um, I'm going to take a pragmatic approach, that we may have made or made in our dealings with Russia post um, Soviet Union. And even in dealings with China and other countries not who are not um, of our, you know, democracies, yes, we need to stick together with people who hold our same values, but um, we can't always expect that um, everyone will want to embrace what we embrace sure. in the U.S. Let me ask also, uh, in the same connection, so for a while uh, during the, um, after the fall, uh, the Berlin Wall and then the breakup of the Soviet Union, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of U.S. government effort on helping NGOs helping NGOs in, in Russia in particular, and some of the other uh, w countries that were within the so-called Soviet bloc. That's kind, kind of disappeared. Um, how, are there, what do you think about, can NGOs, non-governmental organizations that have some influence over public opinion, can have programs and things, is there a role for them? And I'm not saying sponsored by the United States, but being able to grow on their own. You know, we look at protests now, so couldn't do that in the Soviet period very much. You'd be thrown in jail right away. Some of the demonstrators are treated badly now as well, but there are people out in the streets. Are there, is there a role, do you think, for uh, private organizations to influence policy and move the country toward a more representative system? You have to say more than no. 
Okay. Well, but at least I would just say not foreign because foreign NGOs are No, are not banned. foreign NGOs. So, haven't. and are there, but I guess that would be a question yeah, for Evgeny, are there sure. Russian um, NGOs that maybe could do some of the, this work? The reason, you know, I'm smiling is because, you know, since the Soviet Union collapsed and then, you know, uh, Russia was undergoing this very difficult period of transition along with other post-communist countries and then, you know, we were trying to set up independent media and da 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 And each time I was meeting with somebody, you know, from, uh, you know, the State Department or European Union or you name it, and they always asked me, Evgenia, tell us, how can we help you? Mm -hmm. It was regular question. And uh, usually there was, you know, Dima Muratov, you know, the, the editor-in-chief of Nova Gazeta, and me, and all of our, uh, both of us, we always had one and the same answer. We don't need help from you, because we are dead the minute you start helping mm -hmm. us. All we need, we need ads. Guys, you know, we, you know, we cannot take grants from you. We cannot take money from you. Uh, but we, you have, you ambassador of Sweden, you ambassador of United Kingdom, you ambassador of Germany. And they all were very nice people, trust me. Uh, you have, you know, in Sweden you have a care. In Germany you have, have a lot of different enterprises. In the United States you have all kind of foundations, institutions, you know, you name it. Give us ads. That's all we need to survive. No, explain, because explain Russian, the, the, the Russian ads. businesses are dead afraid, we're dead afraid to give ads to opposition media, especially when Putin came into power and, you know, Czechs took over the country so, so meaning, you know, the, the KGB, you know, then the successes, they took over the, you know, all branches of the government. And so to give an ad to the New Times was to put on your elbow, I am against Putin. So no Russian business in good conscience could do it, could do it legally. So, yes, there were tons, tons of times when they were coming to me, you know, I was meeting with them, and they were bringing me the package, $100,000 in one package. And I said, listen, how do you expect me to deal with that? Therefore, we were in bad need of ads, real ads, from the Western-run companies. All, you know, I mean, okay, IKEA is present in Moscow, probably it's hard for IKEA. But in Sweden there were a couple of other companies like IKEA. Or, you know, there were, you know, there were different uh, institutions in the United States of America. You look, Open Guardian, Open Financial Times, Open Le Monde, Le Figaro, Le Republic, and you will see all these ads from different institutions, schools, universities, foundations. That's what we were asking for, not once. And then, you know, another meeting, and another meeting, and hi, <laughs> Evgenia, how can we help you? You know, thank you very much. You know, we ended, you know, at, at the, you know, once, I got, you know, because, you know, we were totally out of any money, it was, and I got a grant for European Endowment for Democracy. Then the next year I was fined at the amount of 22.5 million rubles, the biggest fine in the history of the Russian media. So that's it. So, and that is very interesting because you assume we're, Russians were very naive. We expect that when we were asked, how could we help you, that people meant that. Now I understand that, in fact, it means nothing, you know. How are you doing? Oh, you know, my mom died. Oh, you know, nice to meet you. See you next time. <laughs> but it took me you know, a while to realize that it's always this chat chat. What, uh, Evgenia, 
I'm sorry. What, no. <laughs> no, I want to. I would, I would, uh, I'd like you never, to Never, never happen. Just never, never, ever. May I suggest yes. that you be a little more passionate about this thing? <laughs> you know? Like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> right. <you know? laughs> well, okay. No, I understand. Um, so what do you mean by ads, for one thing? I mean, wh I mean why would they... why would advertisements. In Russian... In Russian, would they be able to take it, for one thing? Would they be able to take yes, it? Yes, of course. Of course we could take it. Of course. And without any no, pressure from the government? No, that was okay, you know. <laughs> it was legal. It was supposed to be legal. And, you know, yes. And the only way for us to operate as Russia is to be absolutely transparent and legal. Sure. Sure. Because the minute I would allow myself to do something illegal, I'm dead. Yeah. Of course, it could. So you started up by saying the um, the media is dead. Yes. I'm quoting you now. Yes, very good. You know. Can the yes. media rise from the dead? You know. And I want to get your opinion as well on this. No, especially with the changes that you know were pronounced today. Basically, today happened coup d'état. So. Uh, right. No, but. Uh, we know, you know, those of us who, in, you know, do theory of political regimes, we do know that authoritarian regimes are quite unstable. Mm -hmm. So uh, they tend uh, to collapse as a result of, you know, split of the elites, elite politics, and etc. So hopefully, and you know, the mean age of. Uh, uh, authoritarian regime is about 11 years. So of course you understand that I'm trying to convince myself that you know that I have some future ahead of me. So, <laughs> so but of course you know that when the regime collapses, we're going to have you know media. So you must have some hope. You go back. But that's what you know. Right. I love it, you know, because it's you know it's okay. It's a challenge. You know, it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's, and it's just you're running. You're you're getting now, high there. Each time you see another surveillance, you feel real good, you know. Okay. Now I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask the dispassionate <laughs> former American diplomat, the dispassionate, to show some passion also about what. So when you were there, you heard what uh, uh, what Eugenie, Eugenie was saying. Um, what? How did the embassy view its role in in, uh, in trying to promote uh, a more representative government? Um, rep, why promote representative government? For one thing, representative governments tend to be more cautious in international affairs, particularly if they have some, you know, they have some blocks on their on their activities, that so that the executive cannot do everything that executive wants because he has to think about the legislature or the population. So what were we, um, when you were there, right after the collapse, uh, what was our policy centered on? What were we trying to do? And do you think at all that it was effective? Because I think Evgenia does not think it was Well, I mean, effective. there are two different times I was there in 1992 to 94. It's sure. completely different than in 2009. Sure. So in 1992 to 94, I think things were really trying to be sorted out. And um, and how would, as Evgenia mentioned, if there's a rebirth, but even then, uh, you know, people were trained as journalists, but perhaps there was a whole new world. And I think we were focused a lot on um, creating um, opportunities for American business and mm -hmm. looking for ways that we could have partnerships um, because we thought that um, communism was dead and <clears throat> you know th that Russia was moving toward being a liberal democracy just like the United States of America that's what we thought I mean I'm, I mean in, and now in hindsight you know if I've, it seems very, very, you know, naive to have Do thought that. Do you think that. that was the basis of the policy? Because that does sound naive to me. If you've studied Russian history, you would know but I think most that people that's, a, that's a big job. Well, and I think a lot of people, that's an, a mistake perhaps we make in the United States of America because mm -hmm. we don't look at the history and we don't look at sort of what had happened. And even if you look at, you know, what's happening now in Russia is that... Um, you know, well, some of what I think uh, is the problem, and Yevgeny mentioned this when we were talking, is that um, Putin perhaps, or even others in the Russian government feel that we have, for lack of a 
more academic word, we've dissed them. We have, you know, not treated him as an equal, as a, a power, you know, as a world power, and uh, they don't like it. So there's some, I think, um, fear perhaps or insecurity. I mean, to me, who people who are doing the kinds of things that happened yesterday, they're insecure and they look for ways to, you know, control and, and hold power. Um, but I really think, I mean, a lot of, um, I actually worked for the ambassador. I was the ambassador's staff assistant the first time I was there, so I helped prepare meetings. But a lot of what we did was looked for, really, it was in, I'm going to be brutally honest, but kind of in our own interest that we thought, okay, here are opportunities. Here are opportunities for American business. Um, USAID came. Um, you know, Peace Corps Not very came. Effectively. You know, and everything was sort of like, okay, well, here is an opportunity that we never, you know, had before. Um, of course, Peace Corps was different. It wasn't your regular Peace Corps. It was retired business executives come to help, um, you know, help uh, Russians figure out how to run a business in, you know, a more open uh, way. Um, so yeah. I would say, and I think same thing, you know, for the media looking at, well, how, how could we help journalists? I mean, even this was kind of, this was in Tajikistan, but you know we were kind of upset because there were journalists in Tajikistan when I was there as the um, um, ambassador. This was 2014. Fast forward, all who had been trained by us in the United States of America were very good uh, journalists, and they were all going to go start working for like Sputnik or for you know the Russian media outlets. And they said, "Wait, what? You know why are you doing this?" And they said, "Well, look." There's no, it's young, they were offering big salaries to get them to come and, and, and they said, don't worry, we will report responsibly from the Russian media. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, they didn't. But I guess I would say that, you know, a lot of what I remember in 1992 was looking for how we were going to normalize and what we were going to do to create opportunities not only for the mm -hmm. U.S., but then also, you know, for sure. Russians, because there were a lot of, at the time, to have a bit, start a business, you had to have a joint venture. So for an American company to come in and have a business, they had to find Russian yeah. you know, partners. So, um, uh, okay. but you know, later I would say, you know, when I was there the second time, <clears throat> and you know, Evgenia um, with new, had her New Times magazine, you know, we talked and I was probably one of the people who came in and said, well, how can we help you? Because we did, I mean, that was really honest that we wanted to look for ways that we could advocate, but it was a catch-22 because, um, if you're too, if you advocate too much, it could have negative repercussions on her. So how do you, how do you strike that, um, you know, yeah. balance? Well, I think, uh, you know, my 35 years in as a diplomat uh, taught me something which is both a real, a criticism of U.S. policy, but also praise. We we think that anything can be accomplished. Agreed. We believe that we have a mission. And uh, no matter what we're seeing these days, we believe that uh, human rights count and that representative governments are the best ones to work with. And sometimes we get a little bit over-enthusiastic about this when don't step back and say, well, let's think about uh, uh, better ways of using leverage, more clever ways of working uh, to try to bring out these impulses that uh, are, are um, I think, uh, present in every country to try to have more control over the, over the lives of the people. Uh, it's hard for us, I think, my, the lesson is I think it's very hard for us to stand back and be patient. We tend to be a people that, th that think agree. we can do anything and since we have a representative government here that gets, some of which gets elected every two years, every four years or so, we're always looking to do it pretty quickly. So it is, it's a, I think it's both praiseworthy worthy for our country because we have that image of we want to get in, we want to help, we want to do this. And at the same time, uh, it, it looks naive. It's really not naive. It's, it's, the, uh, it's just embedded in us that we can do anything. Anyway, I want to get to... And we can do it quickly. But excuse me, yeah. may Go ahead. quickly uh, just say that, you know, first of all, I don't want to sound unthankful. I think that Americans did have a lot for Russia. For one, you gave us $66 billion, which was in, uh, uh, extremely important in terms of uh, getting through the hardships of 1990s. Mm -hmm. Then, in, uh, as talking about journalists, a lot of journalists, a lot of good Russian journalists, 
they went through all kind of schools here. Mm -hmm. Knight Fellowship, Neiman Fellowship, you had one. Uh, yeah. Alfred Friendly uh, Fellowship. Yes, I was, you know, it was, you know, I came, the very first time Soviets allowed me to go abroad was I went to work with Chicago um, on Alfred Friendly Press Fellowship. So, and it was really very important. A lot of us, we got education here, you know. The fact that I got to Harvard probably was the best thing that ever happened to me. And it was amazing years that I spent. Was uh, Michigan second best or the? <laughs> Listen, you know, everything, you know, and. We, we don't like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I would agree, because there's another program which is still around, although the Russians have come out of it. It's called the Flex Program, Future Leaders Exchange yeah. Program, we which have is the, high the Knight, school. We have the Knight Fellows here, too, yeah. who are here and, on uh, campus. And I think that, that was thing. extremely important yeah. and, uh, you know, to to open and try to open up and create sure. uh, um, uh, opportunities for. But I guess that's why I would say, um, I'm also like you, Mel, that I think, um, you know, the glass is half full, not right. half empty. And that um, having served in um, Russia, I, maybe I don't love it as much as you do, but I've been there twice and I've created, you know, my whole career around getting to know countries of former Soviet Union. And I would like to see a better relationship between our two countries so that you would be able to somehow that perhaps we can be more effective in helping you to have a more, um, uh, some kind of opening, you know, to to um, to be able to practice your craft. And I have a more probably pragmatic approach in that. And I think it's time for the U.S. and Russia to look for ways that we can, um, you know, try to open up our dialogue. Look, you know, Russia is probably the only country in the world who could destroy the United States of America in a matter of 30 minutes or so because of the nuclear weapons. So at a minimum, we need to have dialogue on issues of mutual concern. Sure. And then to bring, um, we were talking about this the other day, but to take the treaties that exist, I was there in 2010 and you know that was a bane of my existence is helping um, the, the negotiators on the START treaty. I would like to see that continue, but then expand. That's an area where US and Russia could agree and then maybe look to include China or look to include new and um, more sophisticated weapons that we haven't had before. And I also think um, this isn't a popular point of view, um, but it's one that's uh, shared by Henry Kissinger, if you read about what he's written. And um, another person, Tom Graham, who had served in Moscow, is not Kissinger Associates. But to look at maybe perhaps we should step back, and if we look at what's going on in Ukraine, can we step back and say, we're going to stop um, thinking about NATO expansion doesn't mean we're not going to support Ukraine or support Georgia or other friends, but look at ways that mm -hmm. we could maybe then begin a dialogue to and cut a deal, make um, some arrangements. You know, we'll do this if you get out of the Donbass or we, but if we don't talk, we really um, won't get anywhere. And I think, I think we have to at least uh, make the Russian government and Putin feel that we consider him to be a world player and that we're willing to make Russia, you know, part of a solution, not uh, maybe the, the part of the problem. Yeah. Let's, so. let's, uh, let's now get to some of the questions from the audience. Um, we have, introduce yourselves, please, and or I guess you were in, were you introduced by John? I forgot. I just mentioned it. Okay, well anyway, introduce yourselves and then we have questions that have come from the audience and you've been, uh, you've been picking up and picking through them, so please go ahead, ask. Hi, I'm uh, Nathan Ojo. I'm an MPP, also pursuing a graduate certificate in uh, Russian. I think you need to speak up. Oop. Yeah. Uh, my name's speak. Nathan yeah, Ojo, there, you go. there we good. go. Uh, I'm an MPP, uh, also pursuing a graduate certificate in uh, Russian, Eurasian, and East European studies. Uh, first question I have for uh, the panelists is, how much do journalists uh, on state-run channels buy into the news they provide, or do they understand that they are effectively government mouthpieces? Did you? I'm not sure, yeah. I understood you. Can yeah. you repeat it, please? Say it, say it again. How much do journalists on state-run channels like Russia Today uh, uh, buy into the news that they provide? Uh, do they understand that they are effectively government mouthpieces? So the question is, uh, they, 
Of course they. They know what the framework yeah. is. Do that's they really why, you believe know, they that? They paid very good bark. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's the, like what I said that the Tajik journalists who went to work for the Russian news media outlets they did it mainly because they you know it, they needed the salary they needed the money they were well paid right. and whether they believe everything or not you know I'm, yeah but I'm you not have sure. had a lot you have lots of friends among among journalists I'm sure and without naming names or anything what does it feel what do you think these journalists feel like when they are basically given a, a, a kind of script that they have to provide for their families Exactly. That they have to pay mortgage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly the same what people think in other countries and in yours yeah. as well. Trust me. Exactly. So I, I agree. Uh, yeah. I agree. Uh, that they have to raise their kids. What yeah. they think. It's very hard, you know. Thanks God, I'm speaking English. But I can write in English. I can make money on the side, but you know, and they have a grown-up child. But for many, for many colleagues of mine, it's a huge problem how to provide for their children. Mm -hmm. That's exactly that. what happened in Tajikistan. That was the only way to really, they made no money in, in uh, the outlets that they could be real journalists and they got lured away um, by larger salaries and then they had to report what they had to report. And the sal salaries are huge, you know. The people are making $50,000 per month, dollars. Journalists? Yes, yes. I want to yes. go there. <laughs> yes. So it, you Good. know, it's it's not easy. You know, for some people, it's not that easy uh, to make a choice. Okay. Yeah, because even the salaries for the Tajik journalists that I'm talking about, ten times what they yeah. have been making. Yeah. That's hard to pass up. Right. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gordon Rooney, and I'm a Master of Public Affairs candidate here at the Ford School. Um, and it's a great opportunity to uh, ask you these questions from the audience. Uh, so here's a question. What barriers, if any, do foreign journalists face in Russia? Foreign journalists, in terms of reporting. I, w let me make a, do a preface. When I, was in, when I was in Moscow, this is in the mid-70s, we had a group of the best journalists that were sent. They no longer send journalists for newspapers anymore. They can't, I guess they can't afford to do it. But I mean, we had people from the New York Times and from Time Magazine and from the Washington Post. And the, they, were, they were strictures. They had to be careful. But they were able to talk to people, even during that particular period of time, which is described as the taunt. So the KGB was a little more careful. In, you know, in the way they the way they dealt with journalists who wanted to talk to people who were not necessarily just those that reported that uh, were part of the regime, uh, and it was an, a really an amazing period. Uh, if you read the stories back into the '70s of what I would call free, you know, j journalism by foreign journalists, um, I don't see as much reporting out of Russia now. There Is was a good, very interest? good book written by Hendrik Smith. Yeah, Russians. he was one of those who was there. Wonderful when we were there. book. He was a Times reporter. Right. Um, but he was one of a very few journalists who was able to mm -hmm. get the inside information. For foreign journalists, it's pretty hard to get information from uh, the decision-making sphere. That's what you want to know. What's going on in Kremlin? What's you know? Uh, when Putin is going to step down or not, you know, why he fired Medvedev, why Mishustin has been appointed as the new prime minister, you know, what kind of, that's very difficult, very difficult to get this information. However, as opposed to what was going on in uh, 1970s that I don't remember that well, uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, <laughs> I had to say this. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you, I feel like <laughs> your father born. now. She wasn't born. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so anyway, uh, people are no longer afraid to st talk to foreigners. As for instance, in my in the Soviet Union, you know, the minute you spoke to a foreigner, you were summoned up yeah. to the KGB, and you know they created you all kind of problems. So in that respect, it's easier for uh, foreign Jones. It's easier for them to travel. They can travel around. Unfortunately, once again, unlike it was in the Soviet times, many uh, foreign journalists, they don't speak Russian, and they yeah. have to. Yeah. There is no way you can work in Russia without speaking. Uh, otherwise, you will have a translator uh, 
Uh, reporting what you said. Yes. <laughs> no, no, of course, yeah. all of them reporting, or, but yeah. you know, I, or not translating what was no, actually exactly. said. That also, exactly. Yes. exactly, exactly. We find that in China. David Remnick spoke beautiful uh, mm. Russian. Smith spoke beautiful Russian. You know, no, no, a, a lot of good reporters now. You know, the, the some of. Uh, those who worked in the 90s, they also spoke very good mm -hmm. Russian. It was important. It's still important. Yep. And, the, and our, our media, unfortunately, just aren't, I don't know, I, don't, I wouldn't say paying attention. I think it's part of the economic problem, particularly with, with newspapers, even when they're online, of having foreign correspondents. All the foreign correspondents, which in the 70s and before, were all over the world, reporting from all over the right. world, firsthand talking to people uh, doesn't happen as much anymore. But listen, you know, it, I think that people are also tired of Russia because there were a lot of expectations. Tired? Oh, tired, tired. okay. Uh, there were a lot of expectations and basically mm -hmm. we're losers, you know. We had an option, we have a possibility to break through and we totally lost. And we lost not because, you know, there was lack of money or that or that. We lost because, you know, that elites turned out to be extremely greedy. Mm -hmm. Because corruption is just beyond good and evil. Because instead of, you know, uh, fighting for values, you know, people were fighting for, um, for how, you know, to steal another company from the state. So that's the problem. Uh, it's, I think that for journalists it's much more interesting should be in Ukraine. That's where a real battle now, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what really is going to be really interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. So China is also very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Hong Kong, what's going on? Taiwan, which just, you know, re-elected the incumbent and, mm -hmm. you know, and fought back, you know, uh, Chinese. So Russia, I think it's a little bit less interesting. And that's good from the Russian standpoint. I don't know whether from, it's good I'm or not. I'm, I'm talking about the the government standpoint. Not so much not so much of a spotlight on what's going on. Or is that not right? What do you I think? have no idea, you know, I cannot read their minds. Yeah, well no. you you sort of can because they've closed down uh, a number of the outlets, some of them that you that you um, work for, or restricted them, wanting to keep the monopoly on what news people are receiving, wanting to uh, gauge the news to their own interests? But you know, KGB people, they tend to be control freaks. And so people who are running the country, they are control freaks. That's why, you know, they want to control everything. Like, you know, today in this, you know, uh, Putin's State of the Union, he announced right. that they're going to abandon, you know, the self-governance on the municipal level. <laughs> it's a disaster. You know, nobody paid attention to that, but that's a real disaster because at least Right. There was possible to do something on the very on the ground, down to the earth, and the, why they do uh, why they're going to do this precisely because they control freaks. Mm -hmm. They do know that you know that will preclude from getting inf uh, whatever you know if whatever little information was available from the ground. They won't be able. There will be you know information asymmetry all around. It's a known problem in political science especially in the third-tier regime. But they do this. Why? Because they control freaks. Because they want to control everything. They want to know everything. They think that if they were going to have their people and their agents and their formers everywhere, they're going to, uh, to prevent, you know, coup d'etat or collapse of uh, Russia or whatever, you know, United States coming down to Moscow and grabbing, uh, no, you know, Ma Madeleine right going to Siberia and grabbing Russian oil. Yeah. Whatever, you know, this, you know, all this <laughs> it's conspiratorial true, mindset, it's, true. it's all there. Yeah. Next question. with this issue of control to an extent, uh, what role do you see alternative mediums like graffiti, art, poetry, and the demonstrations conducted by groups like Pussy Riot uh, play in, in uh, providing access to narratives which might be censored in uh, traditional media sources within Russia? You asking me? No. Yes, the whole panel. Well, I mean, I'm just trying to, you know, think about that. I mean, it's um, people, again, taking a stand on um, in different, when you talk about Pussy Riot, um, I hadn't forgotten about them for a while. But um, <clears throat> the role, I think that, that the 
the space to be able to do that, and Evgeny has outlined that very well, has narrowed, you know, so that people don't feel comfortable um, being able to an express an, a, a, um, an opposing opinion, unless they want to go to jail or, you know, be run out of business. So I'd say there's not much space for um, even um, poetry or writing or other forms of expression. I don't know, I may be wrong, um, but... Well, poetry is in the Russian soul, yeah. I think, poetry. But well, I don't know, I, frankly, I don't know. But when people I was there, writing, had, but when I say that, yeah. writing something that might express a differing point of view yeah. and do it in a, you know, as writing a book or writing right. something. But Not that the they worst, don't appreciate poetry. During the worst periods of Soviet repression, there were still people who did poetry, probably thinking they're not going to understand what I'm really saying anyway. But there were poets that challenged in a certain way, you know, and then they had to write other things for the regime. You, if you think of Yevtushenko, for, mm -hmm. for example, Evgeny Yevtushenko. But do you think people are doing that now? Well, I, I don't know. That's, I don't that's see a question. That. Yeah, there are poets, yeah. and there are, you know, people write novels, people write no, uh, poetry, uh, so and so far. The regime was pretty much, you know, unconcerned right. mm -hmm. about. Uh, Is that because it doesn't go out to the public as much? It doesn't get into the public realm. I it's think they pretty much YouTube. realize that, you know, it doesn't have that, you know, the, or, uh, uh, unlike uh, unlike TV, unlike electronic media, this has very little distribution. That yeah. therefore little impact. Mm -hmm. on uh, rank and file. So they're just less concerned about that. But that's kind of interesting. Authoritarian regimes, they tend not to be that, uh, uh, that concerned about what people think. That's the difference with the totalitarian yeah. regimes. I think, oh, well, again, if I, I, I do a lot of comparison of that, the 70s period when I was there, and I remember that uh, there was always, um, you know, there's this, there was in this sort of word-to-mouth area. New things that were coming out that you wouldn't see advertised anywhere, but, but, but word of mouth you would have this new play at the Taganka or someplace else that had a kind of meaning that might reflect criticism of the regime, but it had to be done in a very sophisticated way. Um, yes, music as well. Technique. Yeah. There was a special technique which was called Aesopic language between the lines. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there is censorship back in the theater, mm -hmm. unfortunately, yes. So uh, we will see how this will go with respect to, uh, to uh, novels. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's go to the next question. Because younger and older generations in Russia get their news from different sources, how does it affect or change the generational divide mm -hmm. or generational gap? I mean, I would say it's the same in the U.S. I mean, people over 50 watch, you know, the network or CNN or Fox News, and um, people who are younger of your generation, um, you know, some people get it from social media, some people get it from, but they don't get it in the same way people from my generation um, get the news. So, and it appears to me at least, I, you know, I haven't lived in Russia since 2010, but I can tell you that's the way things also were in countries of former Soviet Union in Central Asia, is that um, the older people would watch the news and they had no alternative. It was only the Russian language, um, uh, networks and there were some people who could speak English but even CNN or BBC were harder you know to come by uh, so um, so I guess it depends on um, it's an issue for even our country what do you see on the news if you're my age and I'm watching the NBC nightly news as opposed to what you see if you never watch the television, but you just get your news from reading online or from other sources. Comedy and, Channel. Yeah, and the one thing that yeah. I guess I would, yeah, Comedy Central, people used to get yeah. their news from, yeah. especially when Jon Stewart was on sure. there. Um, but I, um, I guess the thing that bothers me, and this is a debate even in our own country, is, is that, and maybe it was propaganda when I was growing up, but 
um, you sort of felt like you could rely on if you read something in the newspaper that it was probably true. Um, maybe it had a slant to it, but um, now you really don't know, and especially with influence of other, you know, someone can put news uh, on Facebook or on the internet, and you really don't know if it's, you don't know, it's very hard to sort out what's fact from mm -hmm. fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I think that makes for a bigger, um, you know, divide. What do you think about the, this generational divide? I mean, is, is, are the new, are the young Russians now, uh, as they grow, as they get older, will they carry those views, or does the system that exists kind of leaven it down you as know, they get older? What do you mean? Views about, about you know, about. Life in general, about the government, about uh, freedom, about music, uh, you know, you said YouTube, for example, that kind of thing. This is very interesting. It's a good question because we see during the last, uh, the last summer we saw unrest in Moscow when mm -hmm. a lot of young people went out on the streets mm -hmm. and about 1,500 were arrested and many, you know, uh, went through jails and some are serving time now. So. Uh, we see that this uh, generation of those who were born after the Soviet Union collapse, mm -hmm. uh, they are much less prone to be afraid. You know, they're mm -hmm. uh, much more fearless. Didn't experience and the old system. Exactly. And this generation of those who are now 22, 23, 24, they are inter more interested in politics, they are sick and tired of Putin because their entire life they know just one president. And when you, you tell them that in the United States there was already four or five presidents and, you know, in, uh, uh, and we still have, you know, Putin came under Clinton, right? Mm -hmm. Clinton, Bush, mm -hmm. uh, second Obama. Bush, uh, Obama, mm -hmm. Trump. So four, right? Mm -hmm. Four, right. So um, then, you know, you... Uh, uh, they they definitely want to see new faces. They they want to see to many of them they're very naive, but you know they are eager to take part in politics and to have a say um, in uh, in in the decisions that are made. So is that what I remember you said earlier? But it will come. In other words, the change will come. Oh, absolutely. Is that what you're bet are you betting that they will hold these attitudes to the point when they get to be able to influence politics or become elected, let's say, in whatever, city councilman or, or go you know, or do something else? I think it will come, come pretty soon. I think that, you know, this so-called stability in Russia is coming to an end. It's already, you know, the system is extremely shaky. And it's going to be even more shaky because of the uh, changes that Putin just announced. So, and there will be, you know, there will be uh, more popular mobilization. Also, it's extremely uh, hard now for elites. No one knows who is who is going to end up in jail. You know, whether you're a governor, a minister, or an oligarch. So, uh, yes, there will be popular mobilization, and yes, young people are going to change the system, no question asked. That's good. Oh, that's positive. That's good. Oh, I'm absolutely <laughs> positive. Yeah, <laughs> very good. <laughs> no, but that's an, but it's, a, it's an interesting thing because, um, you know, sometimes systems that are oligarchic or autocratic pull those people that have enthusiasm for having more control into that system itself. Of course. And making it making it impossible for them to enjoy, let's say, a, um, a, a good life with lots of bells and whistles on it, uh, unless they join the system. It'll be interesting to see what the response to this generation that you described coming up will be from those people who, de who depend on keeping things the same, because that's, the, that's where their money is. So I think that's a, it's an interesting question we, we don't know at this point. Um, the, do you think the demonstrations that have taken place most, most recently have affected the way the, the government itself, Putin and his, uh, and his colleagues, uh, operate? Do they have yes. to worry about this? Yes, they do worry about that. 
uh, yes, they're concerned um, uh, because Putin's ratings return back to pre-Crimea levels. And uh, uh, in 2013, uh, 2012, 2013, uh, the trend was uh, his rating was <coughs> down the hill. Mm -hmm. So they're very concerned about that. You know, Russian uh, real incomes are going down the third right. year on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, yes, they are concerned. They should be concerned. Okay. Another question from the audience, please. Over the past 20 years, the LGBTQ plus community in the United States has gained a much greater deal of acceptance. Uh, do either of you anticipate any such changes occurring in Russia as this new generation of Russians starts to um, play an increasingly large role in politics? LGBTQ. I mean, I can give you some anecdotal evidence because I have some uh, gay friends um, who are Russian and who really... Um, took an opportunity, and again, this was in the 90s, and um, switched their careers and started a business. And they actually imported things from, I won't give you a lot of details so you won't know who they are, um, but, and they are gay. And everything went along fine, <clears throat> and all of a sudden, when you talk about KGB, KGB came and turned out that the guy whose driver, he was with KGB and stole their business and then he had to leave the country. One of the others who had gotten out of it has moved on to it outside of Moscow, but is very um, worried about revealing, you know, he stays very under the radar that he's um, gay. So if I look at my experience just with my friends, um, that it's, there's still, a lot of um, discrimination and and of course this guy he lost all his money and then he's finally now he got political asylum in Germany but they just came in took all his money and it was kind of like well you know it was almost like you're gay and you deserve to have this mm -hmm. taken away from you that was the feeling so um, so that's a personal experience that I've um, had um, I don't know if that's widespread, if things have changed, but even in these people I met in the 90s and have continued to be friends with them, and um, it doesn't appear some of them, another one left and has left the country mm -hmm. because they just didn't feel comfortable living um, in the U.S. And I remember one time when I was, um, I probably shouldn't tell you, but I was working for Condoleezza Rice, and so I had, um, you know, I was there in Moscow, and so I invited all my gay friends to come and have brunch with me at one of the Marriott hotels. And you should have seen, like, the looks at people, because here's Susan Elliott, you know, with these, like, 12 gay men. Um, it was great for me, but, you know, it, again, it was something that I think was really unusual for people to kind of express themselves in public. Okay. You know, it is a very interesting question because in the Soviet times uh, there was special there was an article in the Russian in the Soviet criminal court that persecuted gays. Uh, this was uh, changed in I believe in nineteen ninety three or nineteen ninety four. So recently, you know, uh, New Times was the first magazine to publish, you know, this sort of gay cover, you know, we had gays on the cover, and there was a huge scandal, of course. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, people accepted that. I had a reporter uh, who married to his gay uh, husband. They, ha they married in France, in Nice, uh, but they lived in Moscow. Um, and he was writing, and we published hell of a lot of stories, uh, from inside the gay community. Uh, the situation is not exactly black and white. On the one hand, in big cities, people are pretty much acceptable. You know, it becomes, it becomes, it, you know, I mean, people are getting accustomed to see uh, same-sex couples. Um, a lot of lesbian couples, they, they have children, and uh, they're pretty open about that. 
Uh, however, there are parts of Russia, like Chechnya, like Dagestan, mm -hmm. uh, which are totally intolerable. Uh, uh, they totally unaccept for them. You know, any gay uh, relationship totally unacceptable, and people are die there. People are beaten there. People, people experience a lot of uh, there are a lot of you know hardships, but. Russians are getting much more uh, okay with that, you know. It's no longer something, oh, you know, it's impossible. No, no, they're okay with that. I would say well, Russia's more, yeah. In, in terms of the media as well. well, that is the outside media, like YouTube and things, which show um, th that, that style of life uh, in the West in particular that may be affecting attitudes by the big cities at least, do you think? I don't know, you know, it depends upon how, you know, people should uh, read English and understand English. Uh, so, no, I think that's just, you know, people are becoming, you know, there's, uh, of course, you know, there's cinema and, you know, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of open gays and people look at them and they see, you know, that, you know, it's okay. Yeah, so I would agree in Russia it's much more open, even though my friends had trouble then. <coughs> well, Chechnya, Dagestan, is that a religious is that part of the uh, the, the, the religion? Yeah. Muslim, yeah. yeah. Because so that may be in Tajikistan. Yeah, we that may be out to part the of it LGBT as well. community. I've invited them yeah. to my home, and it had to be very. They wanted everything discreet. under the radar, mm -hmm. very yeah. discreet, because right. they there was a lot of persecution. No one would okay. admit they were gay in Tajikistan. I can't yeah. see the clock back. But for instance, in Georgia, time. pretty open. In Ukraine, pretty open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay, yeah. another question, please. Okay, here's another question from the audience. Uh, I read earlier today that Prime Minister Medvedev mm -hmm. and his cabinet resigned. Good. Did he resign? <laughs> Was he fired? Is there any realistic possibility Mr. Putin will not be able to stay in power indefinitely? Well, indefinitely means that he would never die, so <laughs> I guess <laughs> that answers that one. But when the is the fact question? that today happened much more important event than just yeah. resignation of uh, uh, unimportant personality by the name Dmitry Medvedev. Today, Putin basically dissolved the Russian Constitution. <laughs> he dissolved, you know, Russian Constitution was uh, pretty much dead before, but there were two chapters, chapter one and chapter two, uh, uh, with respect to the basics of the state and society and, uh, society and human rights, which uh, no president could uh, touch. Today, Putin announced that there will be amendments to these very basics of the Russian constitution. And Russian constitution is a direct law. It has uh, priority over our, all other laws in the land. Uh, today, Putin basically announced Russian constitution null and void. Uh, he, you know, there is, uh, uh, he announced that there will be, so there will changes to the institution of the presidency, to the institution of the government, to the institution of the lower chamber of the Russian parliament, which is Duma, uh, and to the upper chamber, this, the Federation Council. There will be changes with respect to several most important laws, like law on the presidency, law on the government, law on the distribution of powers between uh, different so-called law enforcement agencies and etc. Uh, he, of course, Medvedev was fired, obviously, you know, but he doesn't have a say, so who cares? Uh, they, uh, Putin created uh, a new position in the Security Council, so Medvedev now, you know, he's deputy in the Security Council. Um, Yes, Putin today, he made it clear to the entire world that that was the base, main message, that he's going to stay indefinitely. Uh, he doesn't want to be a lame duck anymore. Therefore, everything is going to happen well before 2024. Uh, I think that all the major changes will happen in the next year, because Russian law, if Putin decides to say in the legal field, and that's what he 
chose before. Uh, Russian law requires to conduct whatever changes to constitution a year prior to the parliamentary elections. Parliamentary elections are uh, in September 2021, so all changes will be made before. in 2020. And, it, and will this be subject to referendum? Because there was some reference to this. The, uh, he, In other words, voting, uh, exactly. popular Melbourne voting. For you, chapter one and chapter two can be changed only. Right by referendum. By referendum. Right. But they already said, you know, it's very unclear. They already said that no, there probably won't be referendum, but there will be, you know, all people's voting. So it's not clear what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Well, it probably will be one of those up or down kind of things, rather than an alternative for one thing, right? In other words, in other words, the the choice will not be there. It may be. You know, there is. May, well, I don't know. I don't. I'm not. Called, I'm not sure how that would work. something that is called constitutional constitutional. Right assembly that can also, mm -hmm. it's not clear, but you know, they uh, already, you know, he proposed uh, the former tax minister as the new prime minister, right. he's totally apolitical, so it means that, you know, I think, you know, my hypothesis is that basically Putin and his pals, they are reinventing the Soviet system of governance, because that's all they know, basically. And in this system of governance, uh, you know, Putin becomes, you know, uh, unelected leader who is above any law, any limits, any elections. You know, he's like, you know, general secretary of the Communist Party, you know, yeah. head of the Politburo, you know. So um, he also said the that the uh, Federation Council is going to Appoint, approve um, Siloviki, you know, mm -hmm. Minister yeah. of Defense, yeah. right. FSB, um, the power elite, uh, yeah. FSB, so etc. Control you know, the whole government. You know, yeah. Yes. So it is to say that uh, Federation Council will be something, and it's n it's a non-elected body which is appointed by the uh, by the regional governors to say that it will be something like Central Committee of the Communist Party, uh, whereas uh, it's not clear whether Putin will become the head of, there is some strange body by the name Go Soviet State Council, mm -hmm. or he will stay as the head of the Security Council. In this case, they're going to choose the model that Kazakhstan just chose yeah. with respect yeah. to Nazarbayev. Yeah. 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 So, have you got in any sense for the pub? I know it's early, but you know, public reaction or people Who upset cares by about this? public <laughs> Well, I mean, we well, do. We do. Well, if the uh, and maybe Putin does. No, doesn't, it, but, it will be um, interesting to see when when this gets absorbed whether it it stimulates more outrage. demonstrations yes. in yeah. the yeah. streets. Will it be public outrage? Uh, will it be understood for one thing? You know. Yes, because you know, along with that. He gave some perks. Mm -hmm. uh, there are there will be you know uh, some additional money to those who uh, so uh, to those who have first ch uh, child and the second mm -hmm. child. That's extremely important for the poorest part of the country. This is much Soviet Soyuz, the the honored mother. Enough. Who had yeah. nine children? I know, but you know, in this case, you know, we have well, the, 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 the problem of depopulation. It's one right. of the biggest problems, Russia depopulation of the country. Yeah. So uh, let's for the audience tell the, yes. what's the the population of Russia is now one hundred and fifty. No, no, yeah, no. About fifty million. No, no, one hundred forty-four million, and Not plus <laughs> they say one hundred forty-seven because they add population of Crimea. And it's going down. It's. Uh, uh, the amount of those born is less mm -hmm. than the amount of those right. So die. instead of looking like a pyramid, it's yeah. more like this, yeah. which in a lot of countries, even you know, yeah. in Asia, so this Japan has tremendous has implications. Thing. If you yeah. think of the economy, workers, how do you continue to run things when the population is going down and you don't have enough of a workforce, especially a trained workforce? But that's why, you know, we invite... Uh, uh, Tajiks. Uh, Tajiks, Kyrgyz, you know, people there from one, the... 1.2 million Soviet. Tajiks work in yeah. Russia. Yeah, yeah. At yeah. Lower, essentially at lower levels. At lower levels, levels At definitely. lower levels so that the Russian population can consume the higher levels, presumably. Is that right? More or less. Yeah, okay. Yeah. More, more than less? But, you know, I think that, you know, that 
in a way, the uh, Kremlin should be happy about that because you know the more the main source of rent is you know uh, gas and oil pipeline. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the amount of those who get rents out of and gets uh, um, whatever perks out of the gas and oil pipeline the, getting lower. So those at the top they're getting more. I think we're near the really? end. Um, well, last word goes to John Chorchari, uh, but I do want to thank you for this, uh, I hope, was a stimulating conversation. Thank Certainly you. was for me. Well, I want to thank you because I haven't seen you again for 10 years. <laughs> okay. when, you know, when John said to me, oh, would you like to be on a panel with her? And, I, said, and I haven't seen you for about you. 30, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the other thing I can say, I'll tell everybody so I can embarrass Mel, but, you know, he, when I was at a low level, he was ambassador to Brazil, and we went there on a visit. I was one of the advance officers for Warren Christopher, and he treated us so well, and you know, briefed us and invited, he and his wife invited us into their home, had us for dinner, and so that's something that I'd never forget. So when I heard Mel was here, Yevgeny was here, I said, oh, I need to come. Good. So anyway, well, thank, thank you. Thank, both thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.